This is an episode you do not want to miss. I have with me today a renowned psychologist, Dr. Robin McKay, and we have the most amazing conversation. We talk about stress. We talk about burnout. We talk about emotional intelligence and why that shows up in the workplace and for high performers and how we really should normalize feelings and normalize these things that we call intuition that really are our superpower to help us get to the next level that we want to. We also talk about the psychology of women making money and how that is a powerful, powerful thing to really help us get to the next level and so much more. Stay tuned to this episode of the Go Reflect Yourself podcast. Hi there. My name is Heather J. Kreider, and I welcome you to the Go Reflect Yourself podcast. I'm here to bring you real practical brain-based strategies helping you transform your life one thought at a time. Working hard and staying busy will only get you so far. To truly become happy, content, and who you're meant to be, you have to move beyond physical capacities and look from within, allowing you to overcome those obstacles and barriers. My mission is to help inspire you to take massive action, to transform your life, all starting from the inside out. I invite you to watch or listen to this podcast and share it with others who you feel can also benefit from it. I invite you to join my free Facebook group, Beat Burnout. That's where we provide more practical neuroscience and mindset strategies helping you reduce stress, anxiety, and overcome overwhelm. Thank you so much for being here. I'm honored and grateful for you. You are stronger than you believe. You have greater powers than you know. Let me tell you a little bit more about Dr. Robin McKay. She is a top advisor to emotionally intelligent executives and leaders at many Fortune 500 companies and to elite level performers in the entrepreneurship, sports and entertainment fields. She's known as a fierce advocate for women in STEM and other high performance fields. Dr. Robin is a committed ally for diversity, inclusion and belonging. She provides keynote addresses, corporate trainings, and team building experiences focused on innovation, high performance, crisis fatigue, compassion fatigue, burnout prevention, and recovery, the psychology of women making money and leading during uncertain times. Dr. Robin has a PhD in counseling psychology from the University of Kansas, where she studied diverse concepts ranging from positive psychology and creativity to neuroscience and mindfulness. Her distinct range of tools, which span from the intuitive to the rational, serve as the baseline to her soulful yet scientific approach to transformational leadership and innovation. And that's why we love her so much and why she is with us here today. Okay, welcome to the Go Reflect Yourself podcast, Dr. Robin McKay. I'm so excited that you're here. Thank you. Thank you. So happy to be here with you. Can't wait to dive in and see what we're going to cook up today. I know we're going to cook up something good. There's no (laughs) doubt about it. So you've worked with so many different types of people, leaders, executives, high performers, entertainers, athletes, everybody really. And when we think about the next level, If you are a high performer or someone who wants peak performance, you always want to go to the next level, but there's blocks. And I would imagine you you can talk to this way better than most of the common contributors to really what is blocking to the next level. And when I really think about the what differentiates the super uber performers, no matter if it's a financial goal, a career goal even a personal goal, a business goal, there's got to be still those commonalities. Let's just start there. How do you, how do you talk to that? In March of 2020, I was living in Arizona, still am. We hadn't shut down yet. We hadn't been set home. It was right before that because I was in yoga class 
And the yoga teacher was a substitute. So I'd never seen her before, had her before, knew nothing about it. She taught a pretty decent class. At the end of class, we're all laying in Shavasana, you know, dead body pose. So we're supposed to be relaxed, receiving. And as a lot of yoga teachers do, this one started in with a spoken meditation, just some words of wisdom to carry with us in the day. And then in the middle of her meditation, she suddenly said, and just remember, you're just a cog in a great machine. And I was like, my eyes flew open and I was like, did anybody else hear that? Like what WTF was that? Like, seriously. Mm -hmm. And I talked to one of my friends who was in the class afterwards. It was a pretty full class and only two of us, he and I noticed that she had said that. So we've had an ongoing conversation about that. The reason that's important is because for high performers, no matter what field you're in, whether you're an entrepreneur or a corporate professional or in the entertainment industry, it doesn't matter. There is this unconscious, I'm going to call it a program that has been run on the show for a really long time, which has to do with being a cog in a great machine or being a robot or being a clone. And we get on this gerbil wheel of performance. We activate grit tenacity, hard work, persistence, all of those, you know, all those high performance catchphrases that everybody uses. And in 2020, what I came to realize was that all of those mindsets, practices, attitudes that had gotten us to where we were, gotten us to the level of success that we were at, had worn thin and we were in need of something different. Because the, the, in my experience anyway, when I'm talking with high performers, they want to get to the next level. You want to get to the next level. I want to get to the next level, but I don't want to work so hard. I'm exhausted from all the grit. And, you know, over time, the gerbil wheel just gets to be kind of a boring um, automatic cycle that we go through. And it actually leads to burnout rather than next level performance. So I'm going to pause there for a second, because I feel like you've got some things to add to that yoga I'm just, story. <laughs> I'm just like jumping out of my skin because I can just see you there, first of all. And I'm picturing this class and I'm picturing you with your eyes, you know, popping totally open. Your zen, and then I was yeah. like, you're supposed to be relaxed. And you're like, are you seriously telling me that really that's not con that my Zen is gone now, lady. <laughs> and I always look at those opportunities as, mo as teachable moments or moments that are inspiring to me. And in fact, I've used that story over and over again in the last couple of years as I've worked with high performing uh, organizations and people just to illustrate like how embedded even the yoga teachers are saying it. Yeah. But what I think that? that's the point though, is those things are so embedded. And this, like you said, it's this background, this program that's always going on. She didn't even really fully understand the impact that phrase had. So let's just keep people right there in this burnout cycle. We're in this, you know, supposed to be unwinding and allowing our minds to expand. But let's remember here that we're just this cog in the wheel. And so I think that's really a great, great point to look at the influence that most of us have around us is exactly that. No wonder we hustle and grind in 24 seven and just work harder, harder, harder. No wonder, because that's everyone's mentality. <laughs> well, and it's it's embedded in our culture and our society and the generations that came before us. There are all of these different levels where that work, we'll call it a work ethic, yeah. where that work ethic has just, it's run its course, first of all. And yet a lot of us don't know that. All we know is that I, I'm bumping up against a glass ceiling and I can't get to the next level. Well, everything that has brought you to this level, it has gotten you here, but it's going to be something different that takes you into the next level. It's not the same old. It's not the same old. And thank you for saying that because just because you do work, and I, I want to I want to digest this just a little bit more. Working hard's not a bad thing, but 
when you really look at where you're going and what you're sacrificing, that's where we really start getting a lot of mismatched. And so let's kind of let's kind of pivot in into that a little bit. Why is it so hard once you do hit that glass ceiling and you're exhausted? I love what you said. The grit and the tenacity worked, but I'm so freaking tired. I can't even think about the next level. I'm just trying to sustain or keep up or whatever you want to call that. What do we do when we get to that point? And isn't it true that when you bump up against those glass ceilings, you refer to your past self? You say, well, what did I have to do to get here? And the brain or the intellect is going to say, well, I had to do, I had to work really, really hard. I had to sacrifice blood, sweat, and tears. I had to stay late. I had to get up early. I had to, it's exhausting me just even going through the litany of things that we had to do to get to the level. So the intellect is going to refer back to the past. What did I have to do to get here? But your creative spirit is looking forward and your creative spirit is saying, I want that next level. I want that level of influence or success or whatever that thing is that you desire, but I don't want to work so hard. And I'm not willing to do those things that I did in the past Mm -hmm. that got me here. I'm done, but I don't know what's next. So you get in this kind of spin cycle because the brain or the intellect thinks that you're just supposed to know all the answers. And quite frankly, it's not possible to know the answers. What I would say though, is what what keeps us there and actually what unlocks the next level is the acknowledgement that you've got to do something different. I have to look for a different frequency. I have to look for a different way of doing things to expand and to ask better questions rather than just lather, rinse, repeat, which worked in the past. That's absolutely beautiful. And there's so many things that you said in there. The average, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, most people, because of this common programming, this common, again, we've got most of us years and years and years of the same patterns. So even though I know this past, I don't want to repeat what I just did. I'm exhausted. I've hit... My head can't go any possible further because I'm so exhausted. But I don't even know what questions to ask other than I'm just done and I don't know what to do. So when you say words like creative spirit really has the answers there to help us and guide us, most people are going to say, that's a bunch of hooey and wooey and whatever. That's not for me. I just know that something's going to break or something's going to fall in my lap. So how do you start to really guide and open and expand this possibility when you're so stuck in the head, the thinking, the intellect? Yeah, the intellect is a really powerful, I'm going to say weapon sometimes, especially against creativity and intuition. And, you know, this path isn't, the path of whether you think about your creative spirit or your innovative spirit or your imagination, whatever that is, the intellect is always going to have something to say about it. Certainly mine even does. I'm one of the most intuitive people. And I say this not to brag, but just because I know what my test scores are, one of the most intuitive people on the planet. And I have a very powerful intellect who can be pretty skeptical about things as well. I just know that for me and for the clients who I work with, they're open enough, they're emotionally intelligent enough to look at Well, if my intellect is only getting me so far, Mm -hmm. there's got to be a different way. You know, Einstein is credited with saying that intuition is a sacred gift and reason is a faithful servant. And we've created a society that honors a servant and has forgotten a gift. So there's something to that, I think, as you're in that kind of, I'm calling it a burnout cycle, right? When you've hit the ceiling and you're go, 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 and you're you're exhausted and you're trying to figure things out. Part of the challenge though, is that when you're in that burnout cycle, you can't get out of the burnout cycle by going on vacation. And even self-care doesn't really do the trick. It requires something deeper than that. It requires some introspection, some support from other people around you as well. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. to open up some of those new pathways into the future mm-hmm. for you so that you're not recreating the wheel. Mm-hmm. I love that quote from Einstein and I'm just giggling because I just used it this mm-hmm. week. And I, it's unpacking that quote is really, it's mind blowing if you really think about it. And it's so brilliant. But again, a version of myself, I would even probably say five years ago, even though I, I thought I was on such a higher path and really growing, I probably would have even had resistance with that concept, if you will. So, and I know a lot of other people do. And it's being open is one thing, but really, really f- leaning into your intuition and connecting. Because to your point, I think especially high performers, people who are on the burnout cycle, find such a disconnect. Their heart and their head, I mean, they're so disconnected. It just physically hurts. So can you kind of talk through a little bit, really kind of going in, in optimizing so you can start to connect those things more, really lean in, trust, have that intuition, creativity as your guide and your intellect to balance out and ask the right questions? How do we, how do we stop overthinking it? I have two things that come into mind. Let me tune in and see which one I want to go with. Um, Let me do this one first and then we'll backtrack and do the second. Um, A year and a half or so ago, I was approached by a, top organization, high performers everywhere, whole deal. And I met with um, an EVP within that organization with all of my stuff on emotional intelligence and positive psychology, a little bit of intuition. I don't do a whole lot of that yet with corporate people because they're not quite there yet. You know, just even bringing their emotions to work is something that they struggle with. And in fact, he did. And in fact, during our just our consult time, he probably said no less than a dozen times that I was just a little bit too touchy-feely for him. And this whole emotional intelligence thing is just a little bit too woo for him. And I had the opportunity, Heather, in that moment, I didn't say anything, but I got to reflect. And I didn't say anything for a couple of reasons, which we could have a whole podcast on. But I had an opportunity to reflect on that. And I thought, you know, I'm not willing to work with people who are going to call the work that I've done for the last 22 years, both professionally and, and, and personally woo and touchy feely. Um, What that tells me more about is where he was at with his own emotions and with his own capacity to access his intuition, for example. And that was fine. That, that whole thing didn't work out at all in terms of, you know, going into that organization. That was fine. I made a decision that I wasn't available to work with people in an organization who's going to, who are going to denigrate what I do. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I love that. And And the reason I bring this forward is because I think that those of us who are emotionally intelligent, those of us who do have access to our intuition, to the non-physical, I'll call it the, the energy or the emotions of how things are going. We, I think we would do well if we would stop agreeing with the people who are criticizing it. If we would s- stop letting it be okay for them to say, well, you're just a little bit too woo for me, or you're a little bit too touchy-feely for me. Now, certainly I have for my entire career worked with professionals in the corporate space, physicians, engineers, you think engineers like to talk about emotions, <laughs> think again. Yeah. And yet over and over and over again, when I come in and I talk to them about these topics, they're open to it. They're curious about it because I can make a case for why it's so important to be able to feel your feelings. When you feel your feelings, you actually have more access to your creativity, more access to your productivity more access to new opportunities for growth and development as well. So I guess I just wanted to to share that because I think that if I'm not in the market or in the business of convincing anybody of anything, and I just want to get out of our way when you're an emotionally intelligent person 
by let's normalize that emotional intelligence is actually a thing. Let's normalize that intuition is actually a cognitive process that is responsible for something like I want to say 90% of all of our decisions are made intuitively. And then we backtrack and make up rational reasons for why we decided what we did from the type of breakfast cereal that we eat to the decision to take a job or to let a job go. Again, it's the faithful servant. Yes. Yes. Give it a crossword puzzle or something to do for a (laughs) while or Sudoku or Mahjong or something and let your intuition, let your inner, I'm the inner child is such an important piece of this puzzle. And that brings me to the second part that I wanted to share, which is we, most people have some level of intuition from the time we're little kids. Some of us, because intuition exists on a normal, normal distribution curve, there are some who are profoundly intuitive and there are some who have very little access to intuition as well. But for the most part, you know, let's say 90% of the population are fairly intuitive. But at some point when we're young, if we have an intuition, I always like to use the example in third grade, I always knew when my teacher was going to have a pop quiz, I didn't cheat. I didn't look at her notes or anything like that. I just had a spidey sense and I would study for what I needed to study for and then take the test and get A's. Yeah. And I didn't have a way of explaining or understanding that. And certainly I didn't share that with anybody because I didn't want them to think I was cheating. But at some point we start shutting down that native intuition in response to the world around us who puts a primacy on intellect, puts a primacy on reason. So I see you nodding your head. Do you have some experiences like that from when you were a kid? Oh, absolutely. And I I just, I definitely want to interject because I can't even start talking about the educational system. We actually teach to unlearn creativity, but we're so grade grubbing. And I'm going through it right now. My daughter's a junior. We're studying for the ACT. You know, it's part of just the process and the game you play, but it's so frustrating. But I keep telling her, this is the process. This is the game we know we're playing. And it doesn't mean that it's in relation to you and your self worth. And so that's really what we start. And I I want you to talk about this more than me, but that's really when I go back and I look at those moments, I felt like something was wrong with me. And I felt like I was, I don't want to say an outcast. That's the only word that comes up in my brain, but that's, that's really not how I felt. But I think that's a common thing that the education system really starts to, to do because we're so grade grubbing and that's what's important. So yeah, there's, there's layers. There's so many layers to all of this. There's so many layers. I even used my intuition on standardized tests and I think it actually worked. I don't know where I learned this, but I learned the clock method. This is when we had sweep hands on the, you know, the second hand on the clocks. Mm-hmm. And if I didn't know the answer to or if I was toggling between two different options on a multiple choice, I would look at the clock. If it was, if the second hand was between 12 and three, it was A, three and six B. And I'm serious. I remember sitting in a physics test and I did that. I got a B on the test. I'm like, how, like, so whatever. Yeah. Right. Whatever. No. I mean, the, the idea here is that for young people, to your point, the education system is really designed to eliminate as much creativity as possible and to kind of lockstep people through a system. A lot of programming goes on. I just saw a picture yesterday in social media somewhere on a classroom a hundred years ago and today's classroom. And they're exactly they're set up exactly the same. It made my eye twitch. Yeah. So, so we have this great challenge within the system that we're working in. In spite of that, intuition can actually thrive. Yeah. The problem is that when you're made wrong about your intuition, think about it. Like if some, you know, some your friend's weird uncle comes up and wants to hug you and you're nine and you're like, ew, I don't want to hug him. And, you know, mom says, oh, honey, just let uncle, he, he's fine. He's harmless. 
well, you know what, mom? No, actually, my spidey sense says no, but we don't get that. We get we get gaslit from other people and then we gaslight ourselves ultimately with our intuition. So bringing intuition back into its rightful place, rightful order as the sacred gift. That's the work I believe that we're all, we've all embarked on to some degree. Some of us are more awake to it than others, but that's where we're headed in the future in terms of decision making, in terms of what we're going to be contributing and mastering here on earth during this time that we're here. And I also want to say this, Heather, the people who rail against this, the ones who are the yeah butters and the naysayers and the it's too woo for me or whatever, they're the ones who actually benefit from the system as it stands today. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who have been for better or worse. And I think a lot of times it's for worse socialized to not feel their feelings, to ignore their emotions, to make emotions bad or wrong. And that's served them well. Mm -hmm. But for the rest of us, it's like, mm, it's not working for me anymore. Yeah. Is this landing? Does that make sense? Oh my gosh, a hundred percent. And what just came up for me hearing you say that, and I want to highlight a few things you said, because there's so, so many good golden nuggets in there. But one of the things I really want to highlight to that is we are human beings first and foremost. We are one person and the institutionalized, I'll say, you know, to your point that these things are serving a, a large majority of people, don't feel your feelings, do these things, be robots. At the end of the day, though, when you really strip down and take a look at that individual and ask them what their fulfillment, joy, and peace is, they're so far removed from that and so busy doing that they're not even connected to who they are. They may not even know it or see it at that point. But then that's when I would say, can we not remember first that we're humans first? And the more that we can be human, the more that we can, like you said, start to normalize that emotional intelligence is a powerful tool in growth and innovation and decision making and productivity and all these things that we're trying to accomplish. But if we would just quit trying to spotlight and label and blame and include, this is really the true diversity and inclusion here. It's all of these parts of us, including our creativity and the ways people think and feel differently. So intuition, I think, is a word that if we can reframe and really just allow people to have more creative freedom, that intuition wouldn't feel so off. That's what I gathered from what you just said. Is that fair to say? I think so. I think leaning into intuition is the way forward. And whether, so my husband's a native New Yorker. He's a, he's a financial advisor. He's a old hockey player, old baseball, you know what I mean? Like he's like a man's man and he has this spidey sense about things. He doesn't call it intuition and he doesn't get all like, you know, weird about it. He just is like, I know people I've got street, he calls it his street smarts. I've got street smarts and this is my, this is what I think. And he's right. And so whether you call it your spidey sense or you call it your street smarts, it's your natural experience in the world that you, it's a cumulative knowledge mm -hmm. of your experience of the wisdom that you have in this, in this life and, you know, in the totality of your, your human spirit, that when you have access to that, it's only meant to help you, to guide you, to bring you into that higher level of potential, wherever you want to go next. Then we can put down the 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 hard work, you know, grit, you know, muscling my way through. It's like, oh, I, that's Sisyphusian. You know the the fable or the Greek myth about Sisyphus, right? He's mm -hmm. the he's the king who was he, I forget what he did wrong, but he he was relegated to rolling a boulder up a hill every single day, and every night it would roll back down again, and then he'd have to roll it back up. It's that Sisyphusian task 
that we have of working in this world as whether it's thought workers or you know, customer service people or whatever we're doing. It's like, how can we make this less Sisyphusian and more human, mm -hmm. more kind and gentle with ourselves and with other people as well? And to your point about inclusiveness, I think that's the way forward. It's not yeah. who works the hardest. Yeah, I, I agree. This is a huge mind, obviously, shift in acceptance and thinking and culture and clearly, but it starts with one individual. It starts with that self-reflection into really looking at where am I, how am I showing up and taking responsibility for that too. And that's that's kind of a whole topic that we probably should table and wait for another day on that one too. Yeah. It but occurs to me that there are some people who are wired for hard work, who tolerate hard work. Quite well. In fact, they're the ones who can sit for long periods of time. They don't even notice that they have to go to the bathroom. They're the, often the marathon runners, the ones who just have this high tolerance for frustration. So that gets celebrated in our culture, but they're a very small percentage of the overall population. We see this in the personality assessments that we give, that that is a very small segment of the population. And yet that ethic they call it an ethic, it's actually a personality facet, is the one that gets celebrated. And so if you're not that, then you come up lacking or wanting where it's just as a personality facet. It's not anything more or less than that. Yeah. No, thank you for explaining that because that was one of the questions I was going to actually ask you because everybody's different. My definition of working hard could be very different than yours. And I think in going back to society, we look at it as time. If you work 18 hours a day, you're really dedicated and you're doing a good job. But then you've got the individual who may work four hours a day and be more productive than the person putting 18 hours in. So there's so many reasons behind this. You want to know how screwed up that is? So my background as a psychologist is with gifted and talented kids. So we look at the kids who are high IQ, so they can figure things out quickly, make sense of things and know what to do about them. That's who we're talking about as adults. We're talking about grown up smart kids. When we're talking about the high performers, the ones who are at the top of every, every field are usually high IQ. Not always, but for the most part. But guess what? When you're a little kid and you finish your math facts faster than everybody else, do you get celebrated for that? Oh, no. Oh, no. I mean, you might get a gold star, but then you have to go help somebody who doesn't have their math facts completed yet, or you get called out as teacher's pet. There's a social cost yeah. for finishing your work quickly. Yeah. Then you go to work as an adult and you've already, you've already figured out that there is a cost. So I'm going to slow myself down. I'm going to pretend and not, and it's not even like a conscious pretending it's going to take longer. We just expand the time it takes to do stuff yeah. in order to keep our friends in order to not stand out in the workplace as somebody who, you know, works too quickly because not only in the workplace, do you have the challenge with community, with your colleagues? Maybe if you're outstanding, you might have some competition going on. But then also you just get assigned more work. Like there's no, my mom used to say, there's no rest for the weary. And that's mm -hmm. kind of that, that energy of it. That's how screwed up this is. Mm -hmm. So if we could just start looking at, just do your thing. And then when you get done with your thing, go do something else that you love to do or go play or go have fun or go watch Netflix, whatever it is, just get it done as fast as you can, as well as you can. Yeah. How would that shift things? Yeah. I, <laughs> I'm laughing again, because I have dealt with this with my, my youngest child, my son, his whole, he's 14 now in eighth grade. And I can't tell you how many times that exact scenario has come up, especially, I mean, you talk about math and that's one of the He's a very efficient little guy. He 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 is speedy. He wants to get everything done as quickly as possible. And he's been labeled 
that that's bad. But he is very accurate. It's not just quick, it's accurate. And I've had several discussion. He actually got a bad grade and a bad participation grade recently because he was done quickly. And then he was on his computer playing games for the rest of the class period. And I had a conversation with the teacher because I said, tell me why his participation grade suffered because he got done with the assignment you gave him quicker than the other kids. And so this just highlights, this is rinse and repeat, even teachers, no offense, I could never be a teacher, God love them for what they do, but they don't stop and think, what are they doing? What are they teaching? What are they rewarding? Why is this a punishment for Pete's sake? So like I said, the education piece is a big deal, but honestly, that's where so much of this starts. I mean, again, you can speak to this, but those development years in our brains, that's where all this comes from. So why are we putting, why is that such an institutional process instead of the most celebrated process of our lives is learning, especially in those years? I think the yoga teacher that I talked about at the beginning was a truth teller. I think that in a lot of ways, we're programmed to be cogs in a great machine. And it's our consciousness that makes us unique. And it's our consciousness that's going to get us out of that machine. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Heather. Sometimes at the, I'm at a point where I feel like I'm either in the matrix or I'm in the Hunger Games. Yeah. And I'm not sure which, and I don't think it actually matters. Yeah. But I do think that there's something to that. And my heart goes out to your kiddo, and I'm glad he has you as his advocate. And I was thinking, you know, I helped start a, a school for gifted kids earlier in my career. And I was thinking, oh, he'd fit in. He'd fit right in with those kids. They all get done fast. And then they go play Minecraft or whatever it is that they're uh, playing these days. Yeah. Right. And that's just part of it because we know that those kids, the kids who can figure things out quickly, make sense of things and know what to do about them. First of all, they deserve to learn something new every single day. Yeah. But when you're in a system that's designed, that teaches to the, the average, yeah. of course, average kids, I don't mean everybody is special, but I'm just talking about like average at school stuff. When it teaches to the average, it leaves out these kids who have so much ability and yet it gets tamped down. And they get actually punished for it. And that's something that I know is shifting as we're moving into this next chapter of the world. We're not there yet. Yeah. And I don't think that we're going to get there by trying to fix what's unrepairable. Yeah. So I agree. I agree. So instead of continuing down that rabbit hole that I know I could get on for a very long time, I appreciate that perspective very, very much. I do want to kind of segue completely related, but on the surface, it sounds unrelated. And we started this conversation by really looking at how do we get to the next level? What are the things we've, we've got? Call it tradition, call it society standards, call it whatever you want. If an individual wants to get to the next level, whatever they define as that, I want to bring this to women specifically. You work with a lot of women. I work with a lot of women. And I think, well, here's my question for you. I'm going to table what I think. <laughs> but in terms of women and the next level, a lot of that comes down to financial. And there is a lot of still gender gap and inequality in terms of financial. But I think women have a harder time really elevating their ability to make larger sums of money. So I really want to talk about women and making money and the psychology behind that and what some of those roadblocks and barriers might be. Oh, I love this, this can of worms you just opened up. <laughs> I thought you would. <laughs> yeah. The psychology of women making money is central to all of the other work that I do. It really is foundational. So this is such a great place to spend some time. A couple of things. First, I think in 2011, the World Bank came out with some stats. Women make up about 45% of the workforce globally, but only possess 1% of the wealth. 
So there's a problem with that right off the bat. And it's no, to no great surprise. Not only that, but women in America, just in the US, weren't allowed to even own their own checking accounts by themselves without a cosigner who was male until like 1973 or 1974. So in our lifetime, we're, we're among the first generation of women who have access to our own money. So we do have collectively a lot of mastery. I'm not going to say we have a lot of work to do, but we do have a lot to master around money. And, you know, in terms of that wanting to go to the next level, a lot of us even have a hard time just getting past how much I need, how much do I need to survive? I only need so much to survive. I don't even know what to do if I've got surplus. If I have surplus, something's going to go sideways. My car will need to be repaired or a kid will need something extra. And that just goes out the door as well. So it's not just in receiving money that we have a problem. Uh, yeah, do I wanna, yeah, I'll say it's a problem. We also have a holding problem as well. We treat money like it's a hot potato. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this over and over, and it doesn't seem to matter even the level of leadership the woman is at. There's usually something around money that's challenging her. People who are, who are even making a half a million a year or a million a year, we all have a next level to get to or to, I'll call it ascend to, Mm -hmm. when it comes to our relationship with making money. So I'll pause there. <laughs> I know you, you got. Love, yes. I am just, my brain is spinning kind of out of control at this point. Cause again, there's just so many layers and, and facets to go with this, but what I really am taking away and what I'm really leaning into that I, I find important is the not just the relationship women have with money, but with themselves and feeling worthy of deserving. Because if we really start unpacking everything you just said, yes, it's a receiving problem. Yes, it's a holding problem. And then we've got just the status of women and even the ability that it's okay to make your own money and a lot of it. So self worth in interjecting into this conversation, how do you talk to that when you've got all of these things out of alignment? I love that you brought up worthiness and deservedness as two of the central things that we need to look at when we're looking at relationship with money. I always like to think about if money were a person, what kind of person would that be? And we can unpack that in terms of usually it's somebody who's related to you and it's usually a parent or a grandparent, somebody who raised you. There's some kind of relationship there as well as what kind of stories do the people around you tell you about money, about your deservedness, about your worthiness to receive money. Mm -hmm. But then I also think I don't, women are so good at making this about ourselves and making it ourselves a project and we're the problem. And certainly we have work, we have, I'm using work, but we have some things to do around that, some healing and transformation to do. But the system is already set up as we can see from the statistics, the system is set up to create that contraction around money for us. Mm -hmm. So I want to just even get in that bigger picture and look at like, what's the What's the system telling us about how much money we can make? Mm -hmm. The system, I'm using air quotes around system, decides that when a young woman gets her first professional position, she's going to be making 10% or so less than her male counterpart from the get-go. And I think of that when I first started in corporate, I was 20, I was just out of undergrad. So I was probably 24 when I started. And I think about the men who started alongside me, if they were making 10% more than I was, then I was probably only a couple thousand dollars difference, but over the lifetime of somebody. And then if a woman decides to, to step away from her career, to have babies or to raise babies or whatever, and then comes back in, she never catches up. So the system is gamed against us to begin with. That's not to turn us into victims at all. It just is to acknowledge that there's more than just 
me being the problem of being a woman and I have to fix myself. There's a, an entire system. So we have to start operating outside the system in order to be able to access and hold the financial resources that are available to us. A lot of people are stepping away from corporate and moving into entrepreneurship where really the sky is the limit in terms of how much you can make when you have the when you know how to sell, when you understand the psychology of money and are are embodying that. Does that make sense? It absolutely makes sense and I really appreciate you talking about that victimization because I think that's also a very common pattern without even really realizing that, and I'll say we as the generic women get into of being the victim and using that as an excuse instead of really taking control and saying, okay, what else can I do then? This is, it's kind of like me talking to my daughter about the ACT or the SAT. Look, I don't love that these tests are here, but this is part of the system right now. It's the game we're going to play. How can we go around it without it decreasing our self-worth and self-value and still getting what we want and more out of it? So that's really the balance of that. Um, Gosh, this is so good. And I'm trying to slow my brain down (laughs) because there's so many questions I want to ask. Maria Shriver just gave a commencement speech to what the University of Michigan in full transparency. I've intentionally not watched it as of this moment. I've heard about it and it's on my list to watch and I'm intentionally planning to watch it at a certain place and time for a reason. But the reason I bring this up is a woman of her caliber, her credentials, the things that she has accomplished She was asked to speak and she first said no, because she said there are so many people much more qualified to speak at this commencement address than me. And I found it so fascinating that a woman of her caliber, what she's accomplished, that she still has this little voice of doubt in her saying, why me? I'm not qualified to speak here. And Again, I haven't actually watched it, but I heard she freaking killed the speech and I'm not surprised. So really what I'm coming to and the reason I bring that up is when we've got this thought loop and this little voice and the self-doubt and the self-deprecation and maybe it's victimization, maybe it's not, that all really, really bleeds into our ability to make money and to have more and have abundance. How do you respond to all that? I remember when I went to Sunday school or church camp or whatever it was, and somebody was talking about how God qualifies the the called. He doesn't call the qualified qualified. Did I say that right? Yes. He qualifies the called. So your calling comes first. And then the qualification is just you showing up. And whether or not you want to use the word God or the universe or whatever, you know, I don't know, whatever the matrix, whatever you want to call it (laughs) is less important than for somebody like Maria or for somebody like you, or for me, if we are coming from a place of smallness, And asking that question of, well, who am I? Who am I? Who are you not to? If not you, then who? And I think that we do that for a couple of reasons. One is because we really don't feel qualified. It's interesting, though, that the people who say they have the imposter syndrome are the ones who should be least likely to actually have the imposter syndrome because of all the credentials and the the public acknowledgments like Maria, like really, what was she doing there? I'm not sure what she was doing there. I would be curious about that as well. I'm not saying that she was gaming it. I'm just saying like, what, what was that really? Right, right. And the people who don't have the imposter syndrome are often the ones who ought to, quite frankly. They're the ones who are out there doing their thing and 
don't have the imposter syndrome and don't worry about it. And they're the ones who sometimes are giving bad advice and shouting from the rooftops and, you know, whatever, making, making a mess out of things. And so I just think that in part it's inverted, isn't it? That we really have to look at if I'm invited to something like that, if I'm invited to speak, if I'm invited to lead in some way, let me find it within myself to be the woman who stands up and leads. Let me find it within myself to be the woman who, regardless of perception of qualification, who contributes something. Mm -hmm. I want to contribute my very best. Mm -hmm. I want to contribute an actualized form of my gifts. Just like with your daughter and her ACT, how can she just contribute her best? Yeah. With no pressure. I mean, there's a, it, a little pressure is good. Actually, it helps performance. We know that. But when we look at the imposter syndrome, even, I have to say that there was an article in the Harvard Business Review last February. I don't remember who the authors were, but if you go back to that edition, you'll be able to see it. The title of the article was Stop Telling Women They Have the Imposter Syndrome. And the argument that the authors made was that these systems and structures are set up to create the conditions for women who or people who are just not in the majority culture, having the most power and privilege in the room to feel different, to feel like an imposter. So the game is set up to create the conditions for you to feel like you're an outsider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I know I went a little bit off with the Maria Shriver comment, but, or the question, but I do think that that who am I, or there's more people qualified than I am has to do with, What's the contribution that I can make today, right here, right now for these people that has nothing to do with my qualifications, everything has to do with my wisdom, with my sense of myself, with my experiences that I've had? Come on. Yeah. No, that's absolutely beautiful. And thank you for bringing that full circle, really coming down to knowing, trusting, knowing that the resources are going to come when they need to. but. I boil that down to really valuing your own value and worth. And I, and I love the frame of reference of the conditions are really for most people are set against that in a lot of ways. So that's when I have to take, I really have to take control have to put my big girl panties on and say, look, <laughs> I've got to take control here. And this is just how I'm going to do it. You know, I'm catching myself because there's another path and direction I can take that. I'm just not going to right now because that really could open up a long, 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 long conversation. But my point is, is, is thank you for reminding us that because really the more we can contribute to other people and believe in our gifts, that's what sparks and spirals. And that's when, if we start shining and helping other people shine and just really have that presence, we kind of start lowering these walls too. And maybe some of those barriers become, they're probably not going to become invisible, but less intrusive, at least. Less intrusive, for sure. Yeah. I think that contribution is important. And I also think that mastery is important to be able to master your gifts, not your lessons. We all have lessons that we have to learn, I guess. But to really master what you're here for, to master what your gift is, is something that I don't think gets a lot of playtime Yeah. in terms of what our focus is. So it's not just contributing to other people, it's contributing to your own growth. It's contributing to your sense of I'm going to call it pride, but I don't mean like egoic pride, but just how you feel about yourself. Yeah. I did my best. I gave my best. Yeah. I'm proud of myself. Yeah. That can go a long way to elevating your consciousness and making, when you elevate your consciousness, you make yourself available to new opportunities, new opportunities for more money to flow in, new opportunities for new people around you to flow in as well. All kinds of things open up when you elevate consciousness. And that comes from mastery and it comes from contribution. And it comes from tuning into that intuitive or creative spirit that you have as your guide. That's awesome. I love that. 
Mm-hmm. So you have recently started a um, a Facebook group that's talked about these things and really kind of helps give some resources. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I love that. The actualization zone is on Facebook and I will get the link I'm sure in the show notes, but mm-hmm. that's the place to be if you're an intuitive, intelligent leader And you're ready to create a new world for yourself and for other people. So this is not for lurkers and it's not for people who are, you know, just kind of lukewarm about trying to figure things out for the future. The people who are in that group are in it to win it in terms of mastery, in terms of actualizing their highest potential, leaning into what's possible for them. So it's a real, it's a real good group to be a part of if you're that kind of person. So it's not for everybody, but certainly... I think that your audience is probably filled with those those types of people. So that's the actualization zone. And that eventually, uh, I'm opening my own academy. And I'm very excited about this. This is still in the formation period, but it's my McKay Academy of Actualization, where I'm going to be taking people through my own methodology that I've used over the past 22 years myself and have helped countless clients actualize their fullest potential as well. So that's what's coming up in my world. That's so exciting. So yes, absolutely. We will put those in the show notes. And I think the best place probably for people to start, if they're curious about just even exploring and touching on what are some of my styles, what are some of the things that are my strengths and that I might be missing A good place to start would be your leadership style quiz on your website. You want to talk to that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. If you go over to my website, drrobinmckay.com, B-R-R-O-B-Y-N-M-C-K-A-Y.com. If you wait just like five seconds, the quiz pops up. And that's the leadership styles quiz that's based on the bigger personality assessment that I've referred to a couple of times during our talk today. That really shows you, are you a visionary leader? Are you a competitive leader? Are you a collaborative leader? Or are you a quiet leader? And every leadership style has its own strengths, things that people count on you for. I just think that if you're hitting a next level limit, if you're not quite there yet, if you're at the ceiling of something, the more you can know and understand yourself, the easier it is for you to navigate these these areas of kind of pinch in your life where you're like, I'm not there yet and I don't want to work harder. So get to know yourself even more. That leadership quiz is the way to really support yourself in doing that. I always like to say quizzes are fun and I guess this one's fun, but it's more like it's it's kind of a for real thing. Like I don't want you to take it just for fun. Take it to learn something, take it to grow in some way and to maybe you find something new out about yourself that'll be helpful for you on your journey. Certainly it'll show you what your next step is. That's huge. And it doesn't take very long. It's not like it's an intrusive 30 minute thing. No, No, I think it's like, I think it's like 15 questions, something like that. It doesn't take long at all. It's just, it's more be intentional about it and use it to, uh, to grow, use it to learn about yourself. That's huge. That's what we're all about. If we're not growing and learning and asking the questions, then we can't complain when we don't get to the next level. And we're just cogs in a great machine at that point. That's right. And that we are. (laughs) And we have to accept that, right? (laughs) I think that's really the question. Are you okay being a cog in this giant wheel? And if you are, that's okay. But don't complain that you're not at the next level then, if that's what you accept. Get yourself out of the machine. You're not a robot. You're not a clone. I don't even think you're a human resource, but you are a human. You're a human. Yeah. 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 We, don't, we don't want robots. We don't. Maybe well, robots. I like, my, to, I like my robot vacuum. I was just going to say, maybe did vacuum the floor, but that's it. I keep telling my kids, build me a robot that in the morning has my coffee made for me already. If you, you know, it's like that. Rosie the robot on the, you remember the Jetsons? I do. Yes. Like, I'm like, I just want Rosie. Yes. That's so true. <laughs> or, yes. or do, or do I, I'm not sure. Actually. Well, probably not at the end of the day or, or Jarvis from, uh, from Iron Man. That'd be fine too, but we are not robots. 
those are robots, not us. <laughs> We're human beings and we want to have a human experience. And that's the good and the bad. <laughs> that's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. Any final, this is Robin, there's so many amazing nuggets here. I know, and I say this all the time and I know it, but we could definitely just continue on for two or three more hours here, having so many other different types of pathways of conversations here, but any summary or parting words or words of wisdom that you would like to leave as we kind of close out this talk, at least for today? I'm going to give you a mind bender. Yeah. In order to actualize your desires, just become the person who already has those desires. So it's about who you can become in the process. So I'm going to steal that because one of my taglines is just become your who. Just become your who. Yeah. Love it. This has been an absolute pleasure. So we're going to post all the links to your Facebook group directly to your quiz. And just in case you're hearing this right now, drrobinmckay.com, D-R-R-O-B-Y-N-M-C-K-A-Y.com. Yes, ma'am. That's where we can reach you. And thank you so, so much. I so appreciate your wisdom, your expertise, and really enlightening us to talk about this in such a, mm, I'm trying to find the right word. Different isn't, I'm really struggling to find the right word. This just feels uplifting because this stuff can be so heavy sometimes. And I hope that the listeners watching or listening feels uplifted as I do and hopeful. So thank you for that. You're welcome. It's my joy to be here. And I love to bring a breath of fresh air. So maybe that's what we're looking for too. That's, that's it. It is a breath of fresh air. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. This concludes this episode of the Go Reflect Yourself podcast. We'll see you on the other side. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Go Reflect Yourself. Please rate and review this episode. And if something moved you, please feel free to share. For more inspired action or to stay in touch, head on over to GoReflectYourself.com or heatherjkreider.com. You can also take the growth mindset quiz and learn where your current growth mindset lies. Stay in touch on all social media at Heather J. Kreider. Until next time, this is your host, Heather Kreider, and I am challenging you to go reflect yourself so you can discover and become who you are meant to be.